The Russian-Ukrainian war has been fought up until now, and all the equipment that the Russian army can take to the battlefield has gone. Today, even the equipment that cannot go to the battlefield Russia is trying to find ways to get it on. This time Russia intends to weld the naval gun directly to the infantry fighting vehicle. This approach is really a big shock. From the images exposed by the media, the Russian army welded the two cubic meters naval gun of the MTLB armored personnel carrier. They are painted with the Z symbol. Not surprisingly, these temporarily modified infantry fighting vehicles will be transported to the front lines of battle. As a Soviet armored vehicle used to tow large caliber artillery in the 1970s, it was a surprise to see the Russians welding naval guns to the armored vehicles. I wonder how much firepower such a thing could boost for Russian armored units in a short period of time. The two cubic meters naval gun carries two 25 mm machine guns. If the load advantage of MLB armored vehicles is used, this temporary combination can indeed provide a large amount of ammunition for the two cubic meters guns, thus giving the Russian frontline combat units a certain firepower advantage. Taking advantage of the large elevation angle of the two cubic meters gun, the modified MTLB APCs could also attack the enemy in high-rise buildings. However, this modification is only to meet the current operational needs of the Russian army and is only applicable to offensive battles. After all, the overall capability of such simply assembled combat vehicles is still inadequate to meet the needs of the current war. At present, both Russia and Ukraine mainly use the method of positional combat, this kind of modified combat vehicle will certainly become the target of the Ukrainian army's single firepower. The battle damage rate of this kind of combat vehicle may not be the focus of the Russian army's current consideration. After all, this combination of naval guns and armored vehicles has obvious flaws, and Russia only wants to use this simple structure but powerful firepower equipment to carry out continuous firepower suppression on the Ukrainian army. This, of course, also reflects the fact that the Russian war effort in Ukraine has reached a difficult point. The rate of replenishment of conventional weapons and equipment has been difficult to catch up with the rate of battlefield consumption. But in the face of the lack of firepower on the front line, the Russian army could only respond temporarily by simply modifying its weapons. As a naval gun from the 1960s, the two cubic meters was originally an anti-aircraft weapon on the 1204 patrol boat. The Russian military chose to use this equipment for conversion, which can be described as draining the last potential of the old equipment. After all, this type of armored vehicle directly welded to a naval gun conversion is extremely fast and low maintenance costs, and using the Russian military's existing old stock can quickly form combat capabilities. But these improvised weapons inevitably become targets on the battlefield. The Ukrainian army also has cases of modified weapons. For example, to bridge the gap with Russia in terms of the number of artillery pieces, Ukraine recycles old rocket launchers from damaged BM-21 rockets and warplanes. These rocket launchers are then bolted to trailers, pickup trucks, or flatbed trucks to create a makeshift rocket launcher. Or perhaps a 100mm MT-12 anti-tank gun on an MTLB. In fact, in this war, this is not the first time that the Russian army has used the welding process to modify old equipment. At the beginning of the war, the Russian army had welded a lot of metal and steel mesh on the T-72 series tanks to act as defensive armor for the tanks. Although it has been pointed out by many people that this method cannot play any role in preventing missile attacks on the top of the tank. Still, in an interview on Russian television, a Russian soldier made up a series of advantages that this equipment offers, even against artillery ammunition. Despite the strong explosive impact, it can effectively protect our crew members. In particular, tens of thousands of crew members have been saved by virtue of these metal nets in the face of the anti-tank weapons used in large numbers in Ukraine. The subjects of these TV interviews are not sure if they are soldiers who have never been in battle or if the TV station's own people are pretending to be them. As early as last May, we saw the true thoughts of Russian soldiers about this metal net. After the metal net was installed, 
the machine gun on the roof of the tank was completely unusable. When the roof antenna is on, the metal net will even burn the car radio. Worse, if a fire broke out inside the tank, the crew would be dead because this stuff limits the height and position you can drill out of the hatch, which is fatal in most cases. And almost all reports state that this equipment is not able to defend against the Ukrainian army's anti-tank missiles. So it didn't take long for all these metal nets to be removed and discarded, which is why they are now rarely seen on Russian tanks. However, Russia still carries out other forms of modifications to its older weapons, after all, the number of existing advanced tanks is seriously insufficient. In November of last year, Russia also showed off the newly shipped T-72B-3M tanks. These tanks were fitted with additional reactive armor, possibly for enhanced protection against cruise missiles or anti-tank missiles. Fenders were also added to the front of the hull, and additional antennas were added to the front of the turret, possibly for a new electronics suite or communications unit. In December of last year, the T-72B-3M received additional changes. First, the tank's side skirts were extended to the powerhouse, and additional explosive responsive armor was added to the rear of the turret. Of course, this Russian emergency-style modification goes far beyond armored vehicles. In January of this year, Russia welded metal frames to unguided aerial bombs to act as glide bombs. For example, the FAB-500 aerial bombs mounted on Su-34s have been modified. The welded metal racks are called wing kits in Russia. Could it be that the FAB-500 will play a JDAM-like role for some time to come? However, this Russian modification does not show any improvement in conducting guidance, except for the addition of the wing kit. There is no laser-guided head in front of the bomb, and there are no wings in the tail that can control the direction. The Russian military would have wanted to throw the bombs at high altitudes and high speeds, using their gliding ability to fly out tens of kilometers at relatively high speeds with simple wing kits. This should be done to ensure that Russian warplanes can drop bombs just outside the air defense range of the Ukrainian army. However, it still does not solve the problem of the accuracy of the munitions. In addition, Russia has also modified its drones at a low cost. Some time ago, Russian television showed images of Russian troops making improvised drone bombs. In addition to the conversion of 30mm howitzer shells into aerial bombs, 3D printing technology was also shown. There were even improvised aerial bombs converted from grenades for use on DJI's small drones. Ukraine has also made such conversions, but the accuracy of dropping such improvised aerial bombs is very low. So retrofitting the shells with 3D printed tail parts can significantly increase accuracy. For example, Russia and Ukraine have both converted VOG series 30mm shells into improvised aerial bombs. This is the ammunition used in the AGS series howitzers. It can be effective against personnel targets as well as various types of lightly armored targets. In addition, to improve the accuracy of the improvised aerial bombs, Russia and Ukraine also added 3D printed tail fins and head fairings to these howitzers. This significantly improves the accuracy of hits when airdropped. There have even been cases where the shells have accurately penetrated tank hatches and killed the interior members. Ukrainian forces have repeatedly used drones carrying such aerial bombs to attack Russian trenches or have used drones as aerial mine clearance platforms, dropping bombs to detonate anti-armor mines. This seemingly crude modification for unguided aerial bombs is actually very clever. But such improvised modifications played a very limited role indeed. Overall, more than a year into this war, both Russia and Ukraine are running out of weapons in their stockpiles. After all, the capacity of Russia's domestic arsenal is hardly enough to keep up with the consumption on the battlefield. And NATO's assistance to Ukraine is likewise not endless.